Welcome to CEO Money. I'm Michael Yorba. Thanks for joining with us. I have Mike Levin, Chairman and CEO of Georgia Aquarium. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here, Michael. I'm glad you're here. You have a broad background. You know, I mean, you've been in charge of the hospitality industry. You've, you've gone in from um, philanthrop philanthropic interests into gaming and politics, uh, public and private turnarounds. Let's, let's start off with um, your take on what's going on right now with international business. Well, I think I think uh, uh, <laughs> that's a very broad question. I I think international business, basically, business all business is almost international today, except local small businesses, and even those small businesses deal internationally. Small franchise businesses, large franchise businesses, uh, the international the international business market requires a a, a skill set that's generally not uh, not taught in spite of the fact that they, you have international relations work and political science and things of that kind. I think that I, what I've learned over the years is it's not greatly different than domestic business. People like to think it is, but I think at the end of the day, it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about understanding others. And so to me, it's not a mystery, it's not a mysterious business. We have a lot of a lot of moving parts right now when it comes to international business tariffs, left, right, and center. I wanted to understand from you how you feel companies that deal internationally are going to find their way through the path of success with what's going on on the political landscape as well as the economic landscape. Well, today, today, of course. The biggest scenario that you see in international work is through the tariff scenarios that are going on with with the leadership of our country. Uh, I think President Trump has made an issue about fairness uh, that doesn't get really talked about much, other than from him, uh, from him himself. Uh, in my experience with uh, both Europe, South America, Asia. Uh, there are, there's no question that there are individual corporations and governments that do take advantage of the United States in terms of equality. However, their, their situation is quite different than ours in many cases. The difference really is many of these countries deal with a much lower cost of labor. That's when you go to Asia or South America or Central America. Right. The lower cost of labor and, and India, Southeast Asia, obviously. You, 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 when you're dealing with lower cost of production, the United States cannot match that in terms of the competitiveness. Our, our, our affluence creates a much higher cost. So it, it's, not, it's not necessarily uh, that that I think Trump really, really wants to, wants to change. Uh, but if you take Western Europe, where the cost of production is very much like ours, and in some cases even more, uh, there have been significant unfairness in terms of the way they handle their tariffs and trade relations. So that's that. So those discussions go on all the time. It affects the marketplace. It affects the relationships of us, not only on the political side, but also, but particularly on the business side as well. That's going to continue to go on, and there's going to be these negotiations that will eventually come to a compromise where we know we can't compete with Bangladesh in terms of producing sh uh, shirts, for example. But, but that doesn't mean that, that, that uh, we, with products that we develop and that we send internationally, that they can be protected by companies that, have, in fact, can't produce those for themselves. So th I think that's where we're going to end up, getting some, some fairness in what we produce versus the, the unusual labor cost structure of produced goods in areas where we can't compete. Do you see any remedy to what's going on with GM right now, the closing plants in the United States, and then they're going to leave the plants open in, in Mexico? Well, I had a very similar situation, not to GE, but in one company when I, I had, when I had my own public company, we had a call center in Marion, Illinois, and I, I, I've done a lot of work in Mexico over the course of my history. You may not see that in my bio. I was on the board of a Mexican hotel company for 12 years. And uh, I know Mexico quite well. Uh, and the reality is that some friends of mine in Mexico called me and asked me to close my call center in Marion, Illinois, and open it up in Mexico City. 
had a substantial saving to the company. Well, substantial. We were a small company. I didn't do it because I didn't want to lose the jobs in Marion, Illinois, which is a university town. I had very good service there, very good situations, and it cost me more to run it. I took the position that I'd spend more. Uh, in the case of General Motors, it's a lot different. I mean, that's an enormous company with enormous expenses that's lost a lot of market share in terms of some segments of their business. I, I think that uh, th there's no remedy for that. I think they, they probably, most probably, had to make that decision. What I, what I would personally have done was I probably would have handled it in a different way. I would have handled it by talking to the president in advance, by doing things differently and things like that, and maybe trying to find other ways to run the business, as they have. They're opening another plant in the United States as well, and moving trucks around and things like that. But many of these companies that complain, to be fair, Mike, I think they've been, they, they've been lack in finding the kind of products that can be competitive. And, uh, but faced with that, you have, a, you, have a, 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 uh, a, a, you have to care about your shareholders and your investors. And so they're going to make decisions sometimes that hurt people. And that's part of our system. I mean, if you want to have a socialistic system or a communistic system, where uh, everybody gets full employment and everybody gets this, then you have that. We don't have that. We have what I think is the best system in the world. That's, that's our, our, our capitalistic system, our free enterprise system. So the fact that GE lost control of their company years ago, it's not only now, they lost control of their company to the unions years ago. And as a consequence of that, their cost of production went skyrocket, but they also were pretty satisfied with a mediocre product base. Their products are not necessarily mediocre today, but they've really lost the market in certain automobiles, and they had to make the decision. How it ends up, I think it's going to end up that way. I think those, plant, those plants are going to be closed, and it's up to us, uh, to our leadership, to find ways to employ these people in other situations. That's, I, don't, I don't think there's any solution. I agree I'm, with I'm, you. Now, let's talk about public and private turnarounds. You, you, you have a, a knack for this. Tell me what, the, the, what you see as some of the pivot points going forward with today's current economic and political environment. Well, I think, I think that, that all companies, in my view, that, I mean, I, I, basically what's happened to me in my own career is I've been fortunate enough to be called upon to solve the problems that other people have created, except for the problems of my own company that I, I created. <laughs> and most of, the, most of my work has been in solving the problems that were created by others. Some of it, some of it comes from really a, a lot of entrepreneurial founded companies that became very bureaucratic over time and lost their vision, and either lost focus or became financially dependent upon various finances and manipulations with, them, with the public market. Uh, by losing that, they get into trouble, they get more debt than they can handle, and they have to be turned around. So I've been fortunate to do three or four of these situations uh, to do that. And, and I, I don't think there's any solution to that because it, management and leadership in these companies is not, it, it's just, you can't transfer one to the other. Uh, and basically greed comes in, laziness comes in, bureaucracy comes in, and you end up in these situations where you have to force turnarounds. Now, you've seen that on Wall Street for years of people that are hired to you know, fix companies. Uh, there were people that were, were blamed. You see it in the hedge fund purchases. Uh, you see the act, there were now activists in there that are going into companies trying to figure out what these companies have figured out financially what the companies have done wrong, but they have not hired the right people who can make, the, make it right because they don't have that kind of experience so what, what it's a very repetitive a very repetitive condition where people like myself have had the benefit essentially of somebody else's errors to be able to create wealth for, wealth for those for those shareholders again so uh it's a long-winded response but i don't think you're ever going to stop that particular cycle what about the gaming industry i know that you've got some insight there what's going on with that well, I think the gaming industry is 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 uh, basically has supply and demand problems. You know, in other words, the interesting thing about the gaming industry is it has a lot of a lot of uh, I, I would say interaction with governments. 
the reason why states want gaming, the reason why cities want gaming, the reason why countries want gaming is because of gaming tax that produces a lot of tax revenue. And oftentimes, uh, casinos are not profitable. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they're overfinanced and uh, they don't make it. And sometimes they do, but oftentimes they don't. But the, the gaming tax is a critical component. Vegas has a very low gaming tax. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a very high gaming tax. So the end result is that states like Pennsylvania and Illinois have made a lot of money on gaming tax. That will continue, but as that continues, as that continues, you have more supply of casinos than you have demand. And so consequently, the profitability of the gaming is gaming industry becomes lessened. And in my view, it's all about entry cost. Entry cost meaning how, how you build the property that you're going, to, you, you're going to run and what the tax structure is. So you're involved with government, you're involved with community, you're involved with lots of labor, and oftentimes you're involved with unions as well uh, and locations. Uh, locations and others make it a very complex, complex business. The company that I was with, Las Vegas Sands, benefited from the fact that the founder of the company came from a, a convention and trade show background. So he always felt that that was a critical component to bringing in people, and he did that in Las Vegas, created a couple of properties that did that very well. Others have copied it, but the more that copy it, the more demand you have to have to fill it. So it comes back to the old economics of supply and demand. Economics one, I think it was Paul Samuelson's book, and that's always about supply and demand. So it can be a very profitable business, but it can also be a dangerous business as well. Give me your lay on the landscape of politics and economics as we go forward. Well, I, I think the politics and economics, are, 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 the, the, dif the difficulty of the politics economic situation is most of the people in public life as politicians, most of them have not run businesses. Most of them don't understand it. Most of them are interested in getting reelected. They spend all their time with their constituents. Some of them spend their time with the, the heads of companies because the companies pay money for that. They lobby, they spend, they, 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 or they give them political donations. And so consequently, they are tied from an economic standpoint, but they're not tied from the betterment necessarily of the people themselves. And so, so I think that, that what you see happening with that is that that's, what you're seeing now is probably not much different than when, when it started back in the 18, late 1700s, early 1800s. There were always influences of those people in power on the politicians. And so consequently, uh, it's, a, it's a job that has to be done. It has to be managed by corporate leadership. Uh, you have to spend your time in the political environment as just as well as you have to spend your time in the economic environment. So they're really one and the same. To teach people economics without teaching them political science doesn't make much sense to me. I agree with you. But in, in closing, how do you see what we're currently dealing with in the political and geopolitical environment work going as we go forward with our economy? Well, that's that's a big question. Also, mm -hmm. I, I think I think that what you see happening in Europe, for example, I happen to be a, a pro-Brexit guy. Uh, it's a long story why. You don't have time for all of that. But uh, I think the European Union has attempted to be a socialist, a democratic socialist situation, not like what we have or what, what we have today. Uh, I, I, I think that if our government holds out, uh, I think you'll begin to see, as you have seen, uh, a number of countries that really want to follow our system for the benefit of their, of their population. Uh, but it's going to be more and more difficult unless government, government and business can cooperate and people in positions of governmental power can, can be not as much worried in the short term, uh, but worry about the long term. The short term means I get elected in two years or I get elected in six years or I get elected in four years. Uh, but when, when you see countries like Israel, South Korea, others that have emerged over the last 40 or 50 years to be very successful, it's very hard for them to hold on to that when, when, uh, when political leadership comes in and wants to change what made them successful in the first place. I think you're going to see, Michael, that battle continue to go on really forever. 
Uh, I, I'm a big Frederick Hayek guy I, uh, on economics. Uh, the Road to Serfdom, to me, is the scariest book I've ever read. And I see that happening now in our country, as well as other countries. And so, but you, 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 you tend to see, uh, as in Brazil, a right, a right wing person getting elected to solve the problems that haven't been solved by the left. You see what's happening in France uh, with a 34-year-old man who's trying to run a country that's significantly socialized and and uh, trying to make those changes. It's almost very, very, it's almost impossible to do that without a revolution. And what you're seeing on the streets of Paris is 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 just amazing. It shows you what, what that conflict of the geopolitical environment can create without, you know, and, and most people on the streets don't understand it. And, uh, and if a leader does, the problem they have in getting and in, in, in executing in that environment, you have to be incredibly charismatic and incredibly sensitive. And that's where you're going to see it happen. And some of these leaders that you see today uh, are not that way. Uh, and, uh, and the end result is real chaos on the streets. And uh, I, I mean, it's my hope that, that, that we can have the kind of leadership that keeps us really solid because China's not going to change very much. Uh, Europeans aren't going to change very much. They are who they are, but they're not going to change by doing the same things they're doing today. They have to understand the political forces. And, and I think France is completely out of control now. And that's, that's a very sad thing economically for everybody in Western Europe and including us. I agree. Mike, thanks for being a guest on today's show. I'm glad to have you, these insights from you, and I hope to be able to have you back on the show so we can drill down to each one of these high-level conversations we had today. Thank you, Michael. Anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been watching CEO Money with Michael Yorba. Thanks for following with us. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.